right. So it's thank you, Massimo. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I thank Massimo and the other organizers for the for the invitation and for the, the chance to discuss some overview of these of results concerning localization of Dirac eigen modes and uh, in finite temperature lattice gauge theory and how they relate to the important physical phenomena that we see there, mainly the de deconfinement. Okay, so first few slides, you can sleep because you know all this stuff already. People in the audience made these things, so they definitely knew them, know them. So you know that QCD has a deconfining and chirally restoring phase transition or rather uh, analytic crossover in some relatively short range of a narrow range of temperatures where both properties, both the, the confining properties and the, the chiral properties of the theory change quite dramatically. And uh, understanding why these two phenomena take place together, how they are linked is the motivation behind this kind of study. So what is the mechanism that, that keeps these two uh, properties tied together? And uh, okay, this is what happens in QCD, but you know that also in uh, other QCD-like gauge theories, there is still a close connection between these two properties. For example, in theories with a genuine sharp phase transition, deconfinement always improves chiral symmetry properties by like a jump in the chiral condensate, uh, which is what happens, for example, in this, the famous toy, let's call it a toy model for QCD, three flavors of staggered fermions on coarse lattices. And when uh, two separate transitions are present, a deconfining and a chirally restoring one, well, deconfinement always precedes uh, chiral restoration. Almost always, perhaps, given what we learned from, uh, from Unknown Monday. It's not always uh, necessary to deconfine to, to improve the chiral properties, but at least for most theories that we know, deconfinement leads to uh, an improvement of, uh, and it's sort of a prerequisite for the possibility of chiral restoration. All right, now, another thing that you certainly know is that both deconfinement and chiral restoration and chiral symmetry breaking actually are, deconfinement and chiral symmetry breaking can be understood in terms of the spontaneous breaking of a symmetry. Although in opposite quark mass limits. So in the quenched limit, of uh, infinite quark mass, you fall back on the on pure gauge theory, which uh, has an exact Z3 center symmetry for, in, I'm talking QCD now. And this symmetry gets spontaneously broken at high temperatures. And since the um, best known order parameter for the symmetry is the expectation value of the polyacob loop, you know, the, the holonomy of the gauge field around um, the compactified temporal dimension, which is related in this way with, uh, with the free energy of, uh, of an isolated quark. So at low temperatures, the expectation value of this order parameter is zero and the, the free energy is infinite and the quarks are confined. And what happens is that the, if you look at typical configurations, the spatially averaged Polyakov loop falls around here, around zero. So that's what a typical configuration looks like. And Above the critical temperature, the Polyakov loop develops um, an expectation value and a zero expectation value. So you find a finite free energy and quarks get deconfined. What happens is that the, on typical configurations, the Polyakov loop gets aligned to one of the center elements. So the key point of, uh, of this slide is this, that deconfinement can be understood as the Polyakov loop getting ordered, which is something that is gonna play a major role in the main topic of this, of this talk. Now, in the opposite limit of massless quarks, if you have NF massless quarks, then your theory has an exact SUNF left times SUNF right chiral symmetry, which gets spontaneously broken at low temperatures. And then in the most physical case of two flavors, it gets restored around 132 MeV, so it seems. Here, the, the key point of this slide is that the spontaneous breaking of chiral symmetry can be understood as the accumulation of um, eigenmodes of the Dirac operator near zero, near the 
zero virtuality in, uh, in some language, zero eigenvalue, if you prefer. This is shown here by the, the famous banks cashier relation. So in the chiral limit, the, the chiral condensate, which is an order parameter for chiral symmetry is simply proportional to the density of near zero modes, not zero modes, near zero modes. Okay, so this is the, this is what we know about the confinement and chiral symmetry restoration or breaking depending on what direction you are taking. At the physical point, both symmetries are only approximate. They are very different, but still they seem to be tied together. And so it would be nice to understand how they affect each other. And here is where the, the topic of this, of this talk comes in. As a matter of fact, there is a third thing happening in the, at the QCD transition in the crossover. And it is that the, the low Dirac modes become localized there. So just a qualitative explanation of what localized and delocalized modes are. Well, they are exactly what you think they are. A delocalized mode is a mode that extends throughout the system. So if you look at the, the wave function squared of the amplitude square of the mode, as you increase the, let, the linear size of the lattice, it scales to zero with some power alpha, which is the, the fractal dimension of the, of the mode. Now, I'm calling them all localized, delocalized as soon as this alpha is different from zero. In condensed matter physics, delocalized applies to the case in which the, the fractal dimension equals the spatial dimension of the system. And anything between zero and this dimension is called critical. But still, these modes spread out as you increase the lattice size. A localized mode instead is well confined in some finite region. And as you scale up the size of the system, the size of the mode doesn't change. So the fractal dimension is zero in that case. This is some here, down here, there is just some explanation of the notation used here. And the fact that here, and in the rest of the talk, I'm talking about normalized modes, modes normalized to one. Okay, so localization is by now a quite old topic. It dates back to the, the late fifties. And the, the paper that started the, the study of localization is the famous paper by Anderson who was trying to somehow mimic the behavior of uh, electrons in dirty conductors. So in a, in a metal with impurities. So the way, the simplest way to, to model this is to take the, the usual tight binding Hamiltonian, which is represented by this grid here and supplement it with some random potential living on the, on the sides of the crystal. The width of the, of the distribution of this random potential somehow measures the, the, the amount of disorder that you have the, in the system. The wider the distribution, the more impurities you have in the system. Now, this model written here is the so-called orthogonal Anderson model. I'll come back to that. The way you study this, well, this is a, this is a statistical system. It's, you don't just look at one particular realization of disorder, but what you're interested in is the average over different realizations of disorder. So an ensemble average of the, of the properties of the modes. So uh, when there is no disorder, so when the, the width of the distribution is zero, modes are delocalized. They're just uh, the usual block waves. But as soon as you allow for uh, some impurities in the system, then modes become localized at the edges, at the band edges beyond some critical point that is known as the mobility edge. And as you keep increasing the amount of disorder in the system, then the, um, the mobility edges close in towards the center of the band. And at some point above some critical value for the disorder, all modes become delocalized. And what was initially a metal has become an insulator due to the presence of impurities. The, um, the mobility edge is also, I called it a critical point because it is actually a critical point where a, a second order transition takes place when you move along the spectrum. You can understand this, there is some characteristic length there, which is the localization length. And this one, this diverges at the mobility edge when localized modes become delocalized. And uh, as for any second order transition, there is some correlation length critical exponent that you can measure and that 
characterizes the system. Now, this is the simplest of the Anderson models. This is the original one, but you can play around and include other sources of randomness. For example, you can try and mimic random magnetic field. And this is done by including also random phases. This is what is called the unitary Anderson model. Now it's a good time to explain what this orthogonal and unitary refers to. That has to do with um, the symmetries of your Hamiltonian under uh, time reversal. And the reason why it is interesting is because as it often happens when you change the symmetry properties of your system, the critical features change. So the critical exponent that you have for the unitary model is different from the orthogonal one. That's why I'm mentioning it. All right. Now, the question is, how do you detect localization? Because this, uh, th that was the general picture, but how do you do that in practice? Uh, the simplest way, conceptually, is to just measure how much of the, of the lattice is occupied by a mode. And this is done by mm, measuring the so-called participation ratio, which is constructed from the, the fourth power of the, of the amplitude summed over, the, the, over space time. Now, this quantity scales with some power of the, of the linear size of the system. You can understand it. Uh, you can estimate this behavior quite simply. If your uh, wave function, the wave function of, uh, of your, your, eigenfunction, your Hamiltonian uh, eigenfunction scales like uh, one over the eigenfunction square scales like one over the volume as appropriate for fully delocalized modes, think of plane waves, then the IPR will stay like one over the volume. You just plug in one over V and uh, it becomes one over V squared times V and you just get one over V behavior. If your mode is localized, well, it just doesn't scale. So that quantity just remains constant. So this is the IPR, sorry, this quantity here is the inverse participation rate. Now you take the inverse of the inverse participation ratio and divide by the volume, and you get this quantity here, which is more intuitive somehow. The participation ratio is the fraction of system occupied by the mode. And if you have a fully delocalized mode, then it doesn't scale. The fractal dimension alpha here equals the spatial dimension of the system. If it is localized, it vanishes like one over the volume. And then there's the possibility of anything in between. And that's what the condensed matter physics is called critical modes. Now, the, the plot here refers to QCD data at high temperature obtained with the staggered fermions and at the physical masses and uh, reasonably uh, fine lattices. And you clearly see that while in the bulk of the spectrum, the participation ratio tends to a constant as you increase the volume, all these points correspond to different lattice sizes. Closer to, the, to, to zero, this quantity is dropping down at the same rate as the volume. And so these modes are localized and these ones are fully delocalized. And somewhere in between, there is the mobility edge where that transi the Anderson transition takes place. Although this, uh, while this is the most intuitive way to understand how to detect localization is not the most efficient way to pinpoint where the mobility edge is. That is best done by exploiting the close connection between the localization properties of the eigenmodes and the statistical properties of the corresponding eigenvalues. Now, if you have delocalized modes and you perturb the gauge configuration or the disorder realization in the case of the Anderson model, then these modes are everywhere and any fluctuation you introduce will be felt by these modes. And so they will be easily mixed by any sort of fluctuation. This is the kind of situation that leads you to think that they will, the, the corresponding eigenmodes will obey the, some suitable type of random matrix theory statistics. For localized modes instead, well, they are localized. They will feel fluctuations only where they are sitting. And so they will fluctuate independently from each other. And so one is led to expect that they obey some Poisson statistics. The, the Poisson statistic. So if, as I showed you in the previous slide, there, are, there is a region in the spectrum where the modes are extended and one where they are localized, the statistical properties of the eigenvalues should change along the spectrum. 
A convenient way to, to look for this is to study the, um, the statistical properties of the so-called unfolded spectrum. So in practice, instead of considering uh, level spacing, so the difference between uh, successive eigenvalues, you normalize them by the average level spacing in the spectral region that you're looking at. So these are the unfolded level spacing. The reason why it is convenient to use these is because there are universal expectations for the uh, probability distribution function of these objects. So there is, for the various classes of uh, random matrix theory, you have, you, you can just extract some feature of this, um, of this distribution and you have a number you can compare to. Same in the case of the Poisson statistics. So for example, you can, mm, uh, instead of measuring the whole distribution, you can just integrate it up to some point in a conveniently chosen. This is what is actually uh, used in practice most of the time. That's definitely what we did use, and it's certainly what is shown in this plot. So you measure this integrated probability uh, distribution of, unfold of the unfolded level spacing in small spectral bins, and then you scan the spectrum. And this is what you observe. Here in the region where modes are extended, this quantity tends to the expectation for a random matrix theory. And the bigger, sorry, the bigger the lattice, the closer you get to the random matrix theory expectation. Here, where the modes look localized, well, indeed, this quantity is closer to the Poisson expectation and getting closer as you increase the, the lattice size. And somewhere in between, there is a point where there is no volume dependence. That's the critical point. The mobility edge is a point, it's a scale invariant point where you will find some special type of statistics, neither a random matrix theory nor Poisson, just the critical statistics at the mobility edge. And the, the advantage of using this kind of object is that it is easy to set up a finite size scaling analysis and measure the mobility edge, measure the critical exponent, measure the critical value of the of this observable that you can then use again to find the mobility edge in other theories with the same uh, in the same symmetry class. So this is something that we did quite some time ago. And either you do it this way or by finding the mobility edge in another way. In the end, in the infinite volume limit, if you use a reasonable definition, you will get the same result. This just happens to be the, the one that is least affected by finite size effects. So this is probably the most precise way to, uh, I mean, trying to match the critical value is the simplest and uh, le uh, least affected by finite size effects that you can, uh, you can do. But you can do it in other ways. And in any case, what was found in QCD 10 years ago already, time flies, is that the, the mobility edge extrapolates to zero in the crossover region. If you go down in temperature, you see that the, the region of localized modes in the spectrum just shrinks. And if you extrapolate, you see that it vanishes somewhere here around some 170 NED. So well in the, in the crossover region. And in the confined phase at low temperature, there is no sign of localized modes. There is by now plenty of numerical evidence from the lattice, not only with staggered fermions as in this case, but also with overlap fermions, domain wall fermions. Quite recently, there was some twisted mass fermion uh, study. And all, they all agree with, in the, with this picture that you have localized modes, localized low modes at high temperature in the deconfined phase, and they disappear as you move down to the confined phase. Which one? On the the on where the mobility the the, 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 cl the critical temperature is. Yes. Uh, I don't know. I should go and check Thomas's paper again. But of course, it. Uh, but it's uh, it's well consistent with what I remember is that it is well consistent with the the crossover re the crossover region. Uh, one should go there and uh, just measure the mobility edge there and see what one sees. But nobody, nobody has done that. This is an extrapolation, of course. 
uh, yeah, another thing that is interesting to see here is that, well, it's quite clear that this is not a, just a lattice artifact because it survives a continuum limit. These three points here are three points at the same temperature, but with different lattice spacing. And they sit nicely on top of each other if you measure the mobility edge in units of the live quark mass. The reason is that this ratio is expected to be renormalization group invariant. And actually, one can prove that it is a renormalization group invariant quantity with a finite continuum limit. I hope to, to put out the proof sometime in this decade. OK, so this is what happens in, uh, in QCD. Now, I mentioned the Anderson model. Now I showed you results for QCD. How are the two things related? Well, it's not really a surprise in hindsight that you find localization in QCD. In the end, you can trade, you can look at your Dirac operator as a Hamiltonian with disorder. Multiplied by minus i, it's just a non to God Hamiltonian. The gauge fields play the role of the random hopping and the random potential, well, mostly random hoppings, but you can also look at them as a random potential if, if you think that effectively at high temperature, you're looking at the three dimensional system. So the, what happens in the temporal direction can be thought of as a, as a, as a non side potential. And then your path integral is just replacing the ensemble average over, uh, over realizations of this order. So it's really no surprise that there is localization. Then you go and look at the critical features at the Anderson transition, and they match what they should match. The, um, the Dirac operator is in the same symmetry class as the unitary Anderson model. And if you look, what is the localization length critical exponent, you find this value. And this is the value measured in the, Anderson, in the unitary Anderson model. And they match each other quite nicely. This is for the orthogonal one. This is the symplectic one. For for those who care about those other points, but that's not the only thing. Uh, one can look also at multifractal exponents at uh, the transition, whatever those things are. But those have been measured already in um, in the Anderson model, and we check them in the um, in QCD, and again they match quite nicely. Then one can look at what the, the critical statistics that I mentioned that the mobility edge, what that is. Again, it matches the one in the unitary Anderson model. So it's pretty clear that the, critical, the mm, criticality is the same as in the unitary Anderson model. What is surprising is that localization appears near zero eigenvalue at TC. Now, that's the, the, the interesting thing. When I discussed the, the Anderson model, I told you, well, localized modes start appearing at the band edge. Lambda equals zero is precisely the band center. So how come that modes, localized modes appear there? This is something that requires some explanation. And this explanation better have something to do with deconfinement. And a qualitative explanation of this and of localization in high temperature is what goes under the name of Sea Islands picture that was proposed by, by Tamash and Buck Brookman some 10 years ago. And then we sort of elaborated upon it a bit. And the basic idea is, is this. In the ordered phase, the typical gauge configurations essentially fluctuate around zero spatial gauge fields and quite an spatially ordered Polyakov loops. So at least to zeroth order approximation, this is how you can look at your gauge fields. The reason why you look at gauge fields like, at configurations like this is because this is a configuration for which you can compute exactly the Dirac spectrum. And the most interesting feature is that this spectrum develops a gap which depends on the phases of the Polyakov loop. So the maximal phase of the Polyakov loop when you restrict it to minus pi pi. And it depends in this way. So what you can uh, imagine is that since your fermions are dynamical, the largest the gap, the best it is for the, for the configuration. They, are, uh, they have a large, uh, larger weight. So this is what happens at high temperature, where the, when the Polyakov loop gets ordered, well, it gets ordered along the trivial direction, along one, because that's the most favorable possibility. 
still, this was the zeroth order approximation. There are fluctuations in the in this sea of ordered polyacob loops. And if you ignore the contribution from spatial hoppings, you can imagine this island as a as a sea of its own, just with a different polyacob loop. So you can use this very same formula to understand what kind of eigenvalue to expect over there. And it will be somewhere here in the gap. So as soon as uh, in, mm, taking into account again the, the spatial, the contribution of spatial hopping doesn't change the picture too much, you can expect that the fluctuations of polyacob loops in the sea of order polyacob loops will support localized modes, which will then populate your gap and lead to some small but finite density there. And somewhere there will appear some mobility edge that separates these localized modes from the bulk delocalized modes. Now, this is a simple picture. You can even make it simpler by thinking that, okay, a gap opens, then I have a new band edge. And then you're just led to expect from what happens typically in a, in Anderson localization that, oh, now I'm at the band edge, I'll find localized modes. Now, uh, evidence, direct evidence for this kind of mechanism has been obtained numerically on the lattice, but in, rather than discussing that, I'd rather discuss the, what is the general expectation that you get from this picture? Nowhere I mentioned what was the gauge group, what was the dimension of the system, all I needed for uh, this argument was the, the fact that the polycope loop gets ordered. So the existence of a deconfined phase of your field. So if you believe this picture, then you're led to expect that you will find localized modes in the deconfined phase of a generic gauge theory. And this is what has been verified in several systems. So here on the left, you see pure gauge SU3 in three plus one dimensions. This is in two plus one dimensions. This is the position of the mobility edge. And as you decrease the temperature, the localized region shrinks and the point at which it vanishes is compatible with the critical temperature, both in three plus one and in two plus one dimensions. Here, the error bar on the critical temperature is much larger because in this case, the Anderson transition is not second order by, but a BKT one. I don't have the time to discuss that, but I just wanted to mention that in two plus one, in two spatial dimensions, the Anderson transition is tricky. Now, uh, the disappearance of localized modes as you confine the theory is not just happening at the thermal transition, but it happens also at the reconfinement transition that you observe when you add the trace deformation in your, in your action. As you increase the, this, mm, this extra term in the action uh, makes, um, Polyakov loop with trace zero mm, favored. And as you increase the deformation parameter, then you make them more and more favorable. And at some point you reconfine the theory, even if you are at temperatures above DC. And it so happens that if you look at the mobility edge and increase the deformation parameter at some point, well, it just vanishes. You don't find localized modes anymore. And perhaps the, well, I find it quite convincing that you find this kind of disappearance and, or appearance, depending on the direction of localized modes in a deconfinement. I find it quite convincing that you find it in the simplest theory with the deconfinement transition. Z2 gauge theory, two plus one dimensions. What I'm showing here is the fractal dimension of the lowest modes, which is non-trivial at low temperature. You have some critical modes there. And as you get at the critical point in the physical sector, so the, plus one polyacob loop sector, they become localized. Instead in the other sector, they become even more delocalized. This is also something that you can understand in the sea island picture, but then again, there is not enough time to discuss all the details. Well, if it happens in the simplest system, you can expect that it happens in all the systems, but I've been discussing only pure gauge systems here. What about fermions? It's hard to find theories where you have a sharp transition in the presence of dynamical fermions, but there are some. One case is this uh, toy model of QCD that I mentioned at the beginning. This three flavors of unimproved rooted Seger fermions on coarse lattices. There is a first order phase transition where both the polyacob loop expectation value and the Carroll condensate jump 
and the localization properties of the modes jump as well. This is where the critical point is. These modes are delocalized and these one are localized. This is the participation ratio of the lowest mode. And you see that it vanishes with the volume. Now, this is a toy transition. What about systems with a true phase transition that survives the continuum? Well, this is something that uh, we looked at pretty recently. And the scenario here is SU3 gate, I mean, QCD with, uh, um, with an imaginary biochemical potential at uh, equal to pi. So this is the, um, this is the, um, the Robert Weiss line, if you wish. So if you sit on this line, at some point you encounter the Robert Weiss transition, so second order phase transition here. And the same kind of argument, here there is a residual center symmetry that can get spontaneously broken, and it does. And here we have a deconfinement transition in a system with thermals. And what happens is that indeed, again, if you look at for localized modes, you find them at high temperatures, and lambda C vanishes at the Robert Weiss temperature. On all the lattice spacings that we looked at, the localization transition uh, takes place at the same point as the Robert Weiss transition. So the continuum extrapolation will, will agree as well. All right, so now it's, there's a few minutes left, but it's time to uh, pay my respects to the topic of this workshop, which is well, one of them is topology. So what does localization have to do with topology? And the answer is that it's not yet fully clear. The picture, the picture is still quite partial. So initially, one of the motivations uh, for, to look for localization was to try and, uh, and verify the disordered medium scenario of QCD. The fact that the, the near zero modes come from, at low temperature, from the mixing of the zero modes associated with, uh, with calorons. And since these modes are localized, if at some point the, this liquid, this uh, gas or liquid of, uh, of calorons gets diluted, then these modes should stay localized. And so one expects to see localized modes at high temperature. And indeed, these kind of modes have been observed. You will hear more about that in, uh, probably in the next talk. Uh, the, and then some study by Guido Cosu and, and, and collaborators showed that the low modes indeed like to sit on anti self dual sites where the Polyakov loop phases are equal to, well, two are equal to pi and one is equal to zero. This is precisely what one expects for L type dions, instant on, instant on monopoles. So, and these pictures are taken from, uh, from that work. So, well, then it's, it's settled. That's where localized modes like to, to be. That's what causes localization. Not entirely. As a matter of fact, if you look at how many modes you have, how many localized modes you have and how much topology you have, well, the two things don't match. You're going to hear much more on this in the next talk. In the best case, in pure gauge, you get only 50% of the localized modes being of topological origin. And even the fact that, well, these modes like to sit where you have topology and Polyakov loop fluctuations. Well, those two things are strongly correlated, anti-correlated, as we heard yesterday from, uh, from Sayantan. So in a sense, you don't really get an alternative, ex an, an explanation alternative to the Sea Island picture. The two things are strongly correlated. And as I showed you, there, there is localization also in models where there is no non-trivial topology without any instance. And so instance certainly play a role in localization, but they are not the full explanation. Now, thermal monopoles, not anything to say. <laughs> uh, it would be nice to look at that. One thing that I uh, observed recently is that there is a strong correlation with center vortices in Z2 theory in two plus one dimensions where there is not much else. But still, it's interesting that if you look at the localized modes, they really like to sit on clusters of, uh, of negative plaquettes, so on center, on center vortices. Well, the delocalized ones are just distributed as you would expect for a fully delocalized mode. Yeah, there are localized modes also at the high end of the, of the spectrum, but those are not that interesting physically. And I guess that 
I'll completely skip this part because I'm um, past time, I guess. So let me get to my conclusions. So what we know is that the low Dirac modes in gauge series get localized in the high temperature phase, in the deconfined and thoroughly restored phase, and they are delocalized in the low temperature confined and thoroughly broken phase. What I showed you explicitly was strong connection with deconfinement in particular. Whenever there is a sharp transition, localized modes appear exactly there. And again, another important point is that it is the Polyakov loop ordering opening a gap in the spectrum and the presence of Polyakov loop fluctuations that is mostly responsible for localization. And this is possibly connected to topology. The third point is the one that I didn't have the time to discuss. So this part is, these first two points are quite clear by now. The physical meaning of, of localization of the Dirac modes is still quite unclear. And even there is the feeling that something is still missing in trying to relate localization and deconfinement. So for example, what about systems without center symmetry? Does it matter? Does it not? What if, you look at systems where the, the two transitions are separate, what's gonna happen in the, in the intermediate phase? And now some question that is a half answer to my initial question. So uh, localization appears when the Polyakov loop gets ordered. Chiral symmetry restoration is the depletion of the spectral region around the, the origin. Local, uh, deconfinement affects the localization properties of the eigen modes. So is deconfinement affecting the localization properties of the eigen modes? How deconfinement affects chiral symmetry? Is it through the localization of the eigen modes that then leads to a depletion of the spectral region around zero? Hopefully we'll find out someday. And uh, thank you for your attention. And here is some bibliography if you're interested.